clapping, I'm talking about you. This is my conviction. What is happening to it? Defending against the modern day downgrade as we head downhill at breakneck speed. Speaking truth, exposing the lies. This is Polemics Reports. You know why you do it. You don't do it because you get paid well. You don't do it because men love you. You do it because you love men and because more than that, you want to honor God. From a location somewhere in the eastern Montana prairie, this is your host, J.D. Hall. Hello, and you're listening to Polemics Report for May 25, 2021. This is your host, J.D. Hall. This is a program we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting to sinners, and edifying to the saints, a program with sincere questions and biblical answers. Thank you so much for listening in on this special Kill the Fatted Calf edition of Polemics Report. We're coming off of a special Zoom event we gave away a, uh, can I say it? I've been saying hole punching device because I'm pretty sure most of our platforms would kick me off for giving away a free GUN. That's called Gun. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, you know, an object of freedom, a tool of liberty, an implement of personal autonomy, et cetera. Uh, we give away a gun, also a charcoal grill, et cetera. Uh, we would just wanted to celebrate. We wanted to celebrate the ouster of Russell Moore, the self-ouster. It's a self-exile, but we'll take a win. We'll take a W when we can get one. We're thankful that he's gone. And we also discussed the imprecatory uh, Psalms and why imprecatory prayers are not unbiblical. But uh, imprecatory prayers are simply asking that God's will be done to the wicked. Uh, and the imprecatory Psalms give us, gives us a full bodied image of who God is. Now, uh, as we talk about polemics and we get into uh, maybe some sincere questions and biblical answers and the topic of Russell Moore with uh, Dustin and Seth and David and other, uh, maybe we have another contributor in here. I'm not sure exactly who's joined us on the Sinner's Bench uh, podcast uh, portion, you know, the, the, the folks that hang around from the bold dogmatic Bible study, uh, into, uh, into the rest of the podcast. Um, as, as we discuss all of that, let me start with some, some good news before we get to the bad news. If I, if I could, in looking at God's righteous standards, um, and, and who his character, we're reminded that the holiness of God is displayed primarily in the two sides often seen in scripture, the two sides of the same coin, God's grace or his compassion, his mercy, if you will, and God's wrath. And, and by the way, if somebody is listening to the program, David, you don't have to edit this out, but put it on mute if you're listening. So I can hear somebody eat some chips, I think, which sounds delectable, but God's what? Are you, you're interrupting my podcast for chips? That's all right. <clears throat> That's all right. Um, oh, it's okay. Um, in, in looking at God's holiness, we see that it's best revealed in his grace on one side and his wrath on the other side. The best place to see that is none other than the cross of Jesus Christ, because Christ Jesus, God's son, came to the world, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of a virgin. He lived a life that we should have lived, and he earned for us perfect righteousness by his active and passive obedience. But then he went to the cross, and in the cross, in that specific place, like literally nailed on that piece of the wood, an, an amazing thing happened, and that is God's wrath coincided perfectly with God's grace. Uh, in Christ Jesus... In his flesh and on his body, in his person, and in his human nature, he was imputed with the sins of, of everyone who would believe in him. And God poured out his wrath that Christ Jesus propitiated. So not only did he bear in himself our sin, but he also bore on himself our shame, guilt, punishment, and the wrath of God. And then he quenched it. The wrath of God was poured out upon Christ because God in his grace sent someone to save us because we couldn't save ourselves. God's grace, the most grace God has ever shown in the salvation of sinners, is seen in Christ Jesus on the cross. And God's wrath, the most wrath thus far that God has ever been poured out, that God has ever poured out, 
has been upon his son, Christ Jesus on the cross. No one in the history of mankind has ever experienced the wrath of God, like Christ Jesus nailed to that tree and nothing in the history of man demonstrates God's grace as much as Christ Jesus nailed to that tree. Both God's grace and God's justice and understanding them is necessary to get an accurate represent, representation of who God is. That's the good news of the gospel, that Christ Jesus died on the cross according to the scriptures. He was buried, and according to the scriptures, he rose again from the dead. And that's good news. If you believe that, repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. By the way, our patrons can join us for the Bold Dogmatic Bible Study on Tuesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. It is on the topic of ecclesiology. Right now we're in 1 Corinthians. The reason for that is because we want every participatory member or reader or volunteer or whatever of polemics report, pulpit and pen, protestia, all those P words, we want all of them to be to be, uh, to be serving members in their local church. We want all of them to be disciples who are following after Christ in the context of local congregations. And so if you want to find out how you can, you know, find a biblical church, if you just can't find one, send me an email, jd at pulpitandpin.org. I will respond to that question. The rest of them will leave for our patrons. You can join for five ninety five dollars a month and get access to the full episodes of Polemics Report uh, and also our archives, not just the free version that you're probably listening to on the Bible Thumping Wingnut Podcast Network or one of their RSS feeds for nineteen ninety five dollars a month. Join us for the Bull Dogmatic Study uh, for thirty four ninety five dollars a month. Get something that you want from the Reformed Gear Store and for $49.95 a month, get a book sent to you in the mail every single month, uh, chosen by yours truly. So uh, that's Polemics Report. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about the departure of Russell Moore, which I discussed last time. Last time it was a two hour long episode. Was that about right, David? Two hours? By the way, I have with me David from Denver, Colorado, my producer and co-host. How you doing, David? I'm, I'm doing good. Excited to have the guys here with us. Yeah, I think the last time that I had Dustin Germain on a podcast with me was like back in 2013 or 14 or something like that. Uh, in uh, a, a brief run, uh, we called it the Contributor Hour. That may or may not be the last time Seth Dunn was with us, too. I think Kofi was. On. No, I've been with you sooner. I remember that Kofi was on that. He said, Al Mola, your house is on fire. Look behind you. <laughs> yeah, I remember him saying, your house is on fire. Actually, that sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I I don't know, he's English. Much. Your house is on fire. Dustin was yeah. better looking. too. Yeah, it's like Charlie bit my finger, but Mola, your house is on fire. And uh, yeah, so that's Seth Dunn that chimed in, who uh, has a podcast, Christian Commute. You might want to check it out. Uh, Seth has been uh, writing for Pulpit and Pen uh, slash Protestia since, I'm going to say, 2014 or 2013. Is that about right? Sounds about right. And, uh, it was, when did Ergen Canner happen? 2014. All right. So it was shortly after that, 2014. Ooh. Yeah, you're, you're, I think, uh, one of the few brave souls who came on board uh, after the canter uh, travesty uh, because you're fearless. Seth Dunn, is, is all, I've always looked at as our main invest, investigatory reporter. He's very thorough. He's very, very thorough and takes a lot of time to produce. And I'm saying he's a slow writer, but politely. Um, but, uh, as an accountant, he crosses his T's and dots his eyes. Chiefly, his main role is to sit in a com box with me and the other contributors and tell me when I'm wrong. Um, but oftentimes uh, I'm the right. new Tom Buck. I never write anything and then tell everybody else they're wrong. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm just waiting, uh, for you to actually, I was gonna say, I'm waiting for you to betray me and run off with Karen Swallow prior, but, uh, Seth actually had dinner with Karen Swallow prior and Seth, I just want you to confirm here for the record. People think I'm, I'm making it up when I say, I think she's a witch. Listen, when, I when was you so met her, t- tell him I Matthew Lee Anderson at that table that I couldn't notice how bad Karen Swallow prior was. I don't believe she's a witch. She, she paid for my dinner. I can say that. And I will say this. When I got home that night, my pulpit and what does that have to do with being a witch? We're gone. I don't what know. Do she being a witch. I don't, nice. I don't think a witch would pay for your dinner. If you wanted a selfie, I wouldn't give it to her. Like you know, this is a discernment so podcast, and you're blowing it. You're like, <laughs> she. Is, you know what? I, I'm the only one 
in the in the virtual room who's met Karen Spala prior. Like I've been at a table with her. And but, uh, I think the way okay. she gets yeah. her point across is kind of trying to make people feel sorry for her. That's how I think she calls off the dogs in this kind of passive aggressive way. That's my opinion. But That's being overly thoughts, nice and making again. people yeah. feel sorry for yeah. her. And I've, I forgot to ask, by the way, if anybody on here is uh, worried about getting canned from their job or something by showing up on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, you might want to uh, avoid that. <laughs> yeah. If, just if be, possible. I'd like to know. Dustin's so a like, Canadian. He's going to get kicked out of the whole dang country up yeah. there. He's on special lockdown orders now. No, yeah, but he, Seth, he, uh, just verify that when, when you met with Karen Swaller prior, I literally told you not to look her in the eye. Do you remember this? I don't remember you telling oh, me that. You're, I remember you're Greg me. Smith brokered the whole meeting, which is hard to do. because I. Do you remember me it. saying, don't get mind melded? Don't yes, I do in. remember that. Don't, I do remember that. Like, she, you, like I, I yeah, was, you, I was afraid she was going to put a hex on you. By the way, you are the only person who I know who has met her personally and personally interacted, who did not immediately come under that spell. What about I mean, Robert Gagnon? I don't know. Did Gagnon meet her? I don't know Robert. Gagnon, Gagnon was at I know the dinner. Gagnon. So oh, you remember the the he podcast? Was, Gagnon was at that dinner. Yes. The dinner comes across like the Star Wars cantina. Man, it of, was me, a lot of weird people around that. Karen table. Swallow Pryor, Robert Gagnon, Matthew Lee Anderson from Mere Orthodox. Was that the guy with the gay, guy. was that the guy with the gay vibe? You'd said there was a that I would say that. Yes. Now David's talking about not getting fired from our job. So in a very PC he was a very way, happy guy. He struck me he as had someone. Mirth of a different orientation than I have. Derek Rishaway was there. Remember they did that podcast about ethical meat and Shakespeare and it was her and two guys. Yes. yes. Derek Rishaway and Matthew Lee Anderson. And there were two other guys or one other guy and a woman. I think they were together. I don't remember them uh, from Adam, but that was who was at the table. Very little was said because Matthew Lee Anderson talks more than this little girl right there. Uh, just yep, yep, yep. He was talking about like how David and Jonathan were super close friends, and your closest <laughs> friends must be man friends, not your wife. Right. And I'm sitting there like thinking, Am I violating First Corinthians five by eating with this gentleman? Like, but he had a wedding ring on. I assume he's married. Well, and uh, if there's I, anyone that very little was, yeah, uh, hex, it's it's you. It was very was a little said about Karen Swallow prior, and she kind of tried to get me to. I don't know, admit that we were picking on her and I wouldn't do it. And I wouldn't give her a selfie at the end of the day. She asked for a selfie. You didn't get it. I wouldn't give it. Oh, but I'm not going to be on her boy. Hey, look at me being selfie with people like no way. Right. Until this day, she would still be posting that as look, I get along with everybody. It, mm -hmm. You'd be like, yeah. Uh, and, and Russell Moore wished for a, let's not forget the point of the podcast. Russell Moore wished for 1000 of her. Yep. And actually that was the line, wasn't it? That put us on to uh, Karen Swallow Pryor is that we had come across this actually, again, Tom Buck and Ken Fryer brought it to our attention. Uh, and so th if Russell Moore says that he wants a thousand more of this woman, we need to check into her more. Keep in mind, we were so sure at the time that Russell Moore was the liberal that we were telling you he was, that just the fact that Russell Moore wanted more of Karen Swallow Pryor made us look into Karen Swallow Pryor. She, of course, has been more easily characterized, correctly so, as a flaming liberal. I think just because she didn't have the gravitas that Moore has, you know, when we first started talking about Moore, people were telling us that we were crazy. But keep in mind, just as we said in the in the bulldogmatic and the kill the fatted calf portion, Albert Moeller is to blame for Russell Moore. Russell Moore is to blame for Karen Swallow Pryor. Um, uh, Dustin has joined us. He's the managing editor of Protestia, and uh, he's the man, truly one of the best writers ever. Uh, in terms of his, uh, he's so prolific. It's he's crazy good. Um, Dustin, when was the first time that you said to yourself, wow, Russell Moore has everybody fooled and this guy is a flaming liberal? Oh man. So like, I actually, 
checked out for a while. And so it wasn't until probably before the MLK stuff where I really started, well, the whole MLK thing really got me to kind of going in that really kind of raised my, my hackles, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah. And that wasn't that long. That wasn't that no, long. That, that was like 2018, yeah. but also I was also wasn't really paying attention for at that point in time too much. Yeah. You checked out for like four years or something. It was yeah. Quite a, quite a decent while. Uh, we were all castigated from the very beginning. I, I, we made the polemics term single issue discerner for this reason. A single issue discerner is someone who only has in mind one issue. It's the only area in which they have discernment. And if so long as someone isn't, hasn't run a foul on that one area, they presume that individual is good. So for example, um, with Russell Moore, the notion was he's a Calvinist. So he's solid. That was Frank Turk's idea. And there are others uh, who, you know, would take the other approach. They're an Arminian or they're a traditionalist. So, so they're good. Uh, and we got to be careful with social justice as much as we've discussed it lately too, and let people know there might be some who do not err on the topic of social justice. Wow. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what you did there. Yeah, so the, the JD electricity. Drop? What happened? No, no, no. Oh. The electricity just went off in the whole building, and all uh, right. So, so my uh, <laughs> Jordan's camera ooh. started to reset itself. We've been every time we write an article on Russell Moore or anything for that matter on anything, we know that there's a significant portion of evangelicalism that will not share that article because pulpit and pen's name is on it, or my name is on it, or you know, polemics report or whatever. Right. And, and that hurts our feelings. If, if we, Seth doesn't have feelings, but it, it hurts our feelings a little bit that we know that they will not share that. And a good example of that, a perfect example of that is David's video, uh, which was awesome on Kyle J. Howard. I really did anticipate that to go viral because it's, I have, I watch it like 12 times a day just for entertainment. <laughs> well, but, but uh, Seth a couple of things. Out, though, Seth didn't a couple say, things. Didn't Seth say that that wasn't going to like like do a lot? And it hasn't done a lot yet. But he's like, I think people are tired of Kyle J. Howard. I may. I think yeah. D Seth was indicating he's he's a cartoon. Uh, I think I. You remember that movie Lucas? Yeah. Where Corey Haim plays like tries to play football and gets hurt really bad. That's right. like spiking the football on Lucas. And I think. <laughs> I think that's why people aren't going to share it. You just the, the first thing is you can make mean. you can't with critical theory you can't make a, a satire video of a black guy. You can't do it. Just like when I commissioned or asked somebody to do the uh, the cartoon of Kyle J. Howard being merged with Elmer Fudd, and it, it said twi a racial trauma counselor. People got so mad and claimed that it was racist, and even James White this was probably the last time he ever defended me on the dividing line. And it was a meager attempt at defense was saying, it's not racist. It's mean. It, it, he wasn't making fun of him being black. He was making fun of his speech impediment. And then uh, Howard came out and said that it was a transcultural accent, not a speech impediment. So I'm only guilty of making trans uh, making fun of transcultural accents, which makes me racist. I said and on I, my podcast the other day that, you know, we shouldn't make fun of somebody for a speech impediment. I think the reason that his speech impediment is relevant is because he claims to be a battle rapper. And right, that's that is point. an activity where two people get on a stage and insult one another in the deepest ways. And it seems like if you had such a horrible speech impediment where you couldn't pronounce rapper, you would not be a very good battle rapper. So I think that's, that's why it's relevant. Justin Peter's position is it's fair game except for the speech impediment because he can't help that. And I'm sympathetic to Justin because obviously he's in a wheelchair uh, a lot of the time and can't, can't get around well. well. And so he suffers from a disability. So I want to be sensitive. I think he's well. sensitive to Kyle J. Howard's speech impediment, but let me, I'll tell you what I told Justin yesterday. I texted him and I said, here's the thing, Justin, if you ever claim to be a pole vaulter or an Olympic decathlon, athlete i'm making fun of you and if i ever claim to be a swimsuit model you can make fun of me right kyle j howard claims to be a battle apple can't pronounce it i'm making fun of him that's all there is to it well and beyond uh, that not it, making it, fun of him because of the speech impediment but because of the stupidity of claiming to have been a battle rapper but it, Sorry, it's also ahead, if David. you're trying to if you're trying to imitate the guy you want to do 
as close of an imitation as you can. You know, nobody's going to, you know, Im- oh, imitate. Right. Um, yeah, no, nobody's going to imitate, right. um, you know, Gerard Butler and not try to do a, a, a Scottish accent, right? It's that does not realistic. I'd make so. fun of a midget if he claimed to be. I try to, I, so I try to do the most faithful version of what I've heard him do. It's not even, it's not making fun of him. It's trying to emulate him. Those are two different things. Sure. If that helps you sleep at night, it's then I'll a, be happy to say I'm making, I'm making fun right. of him. It is a parody. Yeah. There's well, here's where we need to be. It, making it, excuse me for using, is this probably an Ed Stetzer word? Winsome. I hate these words because people tone police us, but I don't ever want my message about what a poor ethicist Russell Moore is and what a terrible theologian Karen Swallow Pryor is and what a big phony who makes up his life story Cal J. Howard is or what a horrible Pentecostal theologian Beth Moore is. I don't want that message ever lost because somebody says I'm being too mean at Russell Moore for being short or for Karen Swallow Pryor for which I've only on occasion made fun of. Yeah. So you, you, and, or then uh, Kyle J. Howard for his speech impediment, or then, you know, Beth Moore for her, hey, hey, big hair, y'all, you know. So it's easy to parody these people. And, I mean, look at Karen Swallow Pryor's new avatar on her Twitter. How are you not going to say something about that? But you don't because you don't want your message to get lost. And it's such an important message that little old ladies are giving millions of dollars to these people. I have not You're seen trying it. to subvert the church. I've not seen it, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's a photo of her dog. No, it's oh, a cartoon of her. It's a cartoon of her with no facial features. That's creepy. Okay. Yeah. A little Super bit creepy. Weird. So uh, about the video, I was going to say the other thing, the other reason I, uh, something stacked up against it was it says protesty at the beginning, which I would not necessarily have suggested for David to do um, because people from the moment are, uh, uh, they play it, that's protestia. And so the argument is more people would listen to you if you had less of a serrated edge. If you Put Alpha and Omega Ministries on it or G3. If you were, if you were nicer. Well, you know what? Yeah. First of all, G G three. Let's remember, only two years ago, had all of the social justice warriors there speaking, paying them to speak, uh, as they were attacking us for just trying to, in the nicest and most polite terms, trying to exercise caution. And I would use that as a case in point. At the time, I had never said anything critical of Josh Bice. We had only said positive things about G three. We'd only supported G three. We don't, you know, we we only provided positive coverage of G three. And you know, their speaker list is pretty identical to the Reformation Montana's. It's the same crowd. And yet the very first time in, in a very polite post about being unwise, I should pull that out of the, out of the memory hole. I just wrote a very polite post about why it was unwise for G3 to have these guys there. We were attacked, instantly dismissed, and so far as Josh Bice is concerned, anathematized. He anathematized us for having the politest uh, critique of G3 that over time has been proven to have been spot freaking on just like, and it was what a week or two after master uh, uh, um, Shepcon. And we had the same complaint about Shepcon and at least Phil Johnson could basically say, yeah, yeah that was a, what, whatever he said, crap show or whatever, at least Phil could have the, the, the moral clarity and the intellectual honesty to give some indication that there was regret in that speaking lineup. Instead, we were just attacked. And so my argument would be when someone says more people would listen to you if you weren't so direct and and you weren't quote unquote mean, I, I think it's the opposite. I think that if we didn't write with the wrecking ball method of journalism, and if we didn't include a serrated edge, satire, sarcasm, snark, whatever you want to call it, I think you never would have heard of pulpit and pen or polemics report and probably never read anything that we've written. I see really good stuff by people who are trying to write in the most diplomatic way possible to make as few enemies as possible. And they're like, they're so obscure. No one ever sees them. They have no impact because of that. What do you think, David? 
Dead air, David. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of editing. My You're going to have a lot of editing on I this know. episode. Well, it's, it's it's my own fault. No, it, right. yeah, it, no, it's it's true cuz here's what'll happen is I I'm not convinced there's any way to be out in front with this, to be the real watchman on the, you know, uh, guarding from the tower and see stuff first and come up with it first because, you know, we're looking for it and not have kind of, you know, soft enemies, so to speak. You know, folks that are theologically yeah. aligned that would say the same thing, but they're irked you got there first. And they're irked I think that they're- you got there first with a little snark and that people are listening to that and not to their more respectable articles that come a year later, right. two years later. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. They're waiting for something respectable to, to share and get the word out, quote unquote, respectable. And by then the wolves have already devoured half of the sheep flock and, and there's just nothing but bloody mutton lying on the, on the ground. But hey, I mean, you're respectable in your warning. You made certain that was indeed a wolf. You know, you did all of your due diligence to make sure that was a wolf. And you determined that it was indeed a wolf because you watched it eat half the sheep. So congratulations. You made it really clear after the fact and it's, and it's too late. Um, so we have seen some contributors uh, come and go and uh, we wish them well, um, but not really. No, I guess some of you do. You can. Um, I I wish them repentance. Um, Well, let me back up. We have some contributors that just, they wrote a lot of articles. They're like, I'm done. Seth, I've often quoted Seth for saying that polemics is like uh, being, uh, what did you call it, Seth? Law and order special victims unit. Special victims unit where it's like, okay, you've been in charge of, you know, investigating child porn for two years now. So uh, why don't you quit before you kill yourself? You know, it's like there's a, some departments have like a time frame. You can only be in the specials victims unit for too long. And I think that's, that's probably wise for most people. Like I don't fault somebody for not sticking with polemics, go focus on ecclesiology for a while or soteriology or whatever. It's just one field of theology. But I think that there were a couple um, or three or four contributors over the years who thought to themselves, I am going to rebrand as a more likable, more polite, and more affable version of pulpit and pen. And a couple of them gave it a really good effort, you know, podcast and um, podcast, uh, not only podcast, but uh, like multiple blogs, you know, they tried to, they tried to really quote unquote compete, which is a terrible way of looking at Christian ministry, but they thought that they could do what pulpit and pen was doing, but nicer and safer. The problem is those projects failed because I don't, there's not a, there's not a nice, I'm convinced there's not a nice way to do polemics. Dustin, what do you think? Is there a nice way to do polemics? Yeah, not especially. Um, do you remember, by the way, if, if you were to ask someone on Twitter, who's a pretty polemical guy, who's pretty good at discernment. I think that Gabriel Hughes would be up there. Don't you? What? W-W-U-T-T, what, when we study the word or whatever it is. When yeah, we when we understand the text. Doesn't he yeah. work for Tom Buck now? Oh, yeah, he did. I think he went to Lindell or whatever Tom's church is. Yeah, his, I mean, his little one-minute things are good. He's a, He is a pretty political yeah. guy. Do you He's remember, been political though, about us. in January of 2015, when Gabriel Hughes wrote the blog post attacking Pulpit and Pen because Lifeway is solid and Tom Rainer is good and there's nothing wrong with Ed Stetzer and Lifeway is just a, they, they, yeah, they've occasionally sold something they shouldn't, but Lifeway overall is really good and nobody needs this 15 movement. Do you, do you guys remember that? I remember, yeah. And I, I, I wrote, I think I emailed Gabe and I said, I've never had a problem with you, but I'm about to have one. And we did a post. Oh, I know what we did. And I did an article and I called him out that what you're saying, because he was running in the certain circles and what we said was unpopular. I think he knew, I'm just going to guess, I'm going to project. I think he a thousand percent knew Lifeway was crap. But he wanted to present himself as the alternative to pulpit and pen, the reasonable discernment guy. In doing so, he like molested discernment. Like it, you 
cannot like looking back you it was an insane position for gabriel hughes to have what the big deal with lifeway nothing wrong with lifeway that i would hope that he would regret and by the way he he what happened with that was because it comes to mind now he emailed or messaged us and says you put my name in this and my church's name in this this is going to hurt my local church um when people google our church this comes up could you please not hurt my church and he asked nicely and he took his article down and he stopped attacking us and we took our piece down our polemical piece down because i don't want to hurt a guy's church if it's a decent church and why wouldn't it be a decent church he's a decent guy didn't he go would, after me from Bill to... karishi i don't remember if he did or not but that's the one of... i remember where he was like oh you guys are being too hard on the bill karishi look at him now yeah and you notice David Wood and everybody backed off uh, finally over that. We're talking about Nabil Qureshi, who claimed to have had visions of Jesus. No, what was it? He had a vision of David Wood and Jesus or something. What was it? Uh, no, no. All the story was at that time is he was Nabil Qureshi was going to speak at that reset <laughs> conference with Ravi Zacharias and Tim Tebow, and the Pope was going to be there. And I wrote an article that said, yeah. hey, wait a minute. I don't know about this Nabil Qureshi guy. And David Wood went crazy on that because they're besties. And David Wood, this is how he rolls. But uh, Gabe Hughes, if I recall, gave us a hard time about that Nabil Qureshi assessment. That's what I remember. Yeah. And then Seth, Seth wrote the article. And it, it was just a word of caution regarding Nabil because um, he had – had some type of vision. I forget what it was exactly, but the story had changed. The details of the story had changed. So we know that evangelicalism loves a good conversion story, right? You got to have a good conversion story. That's what, you know, got Irgun Canner turned to, you know, awry, um, impressing people with his conversion story to bolster his own credentials. And then, um, we pointed that out. David lost his mind and we just kind of stayed on that and continued to point out he's doing some weird stuff. And then ultimately, you know, he gets cancer, but instead of turning to Christ, he turned to Bethel church. He goes down there to have those hocus pocus morons lay hands on him. He's seeking healing. And after he died, by the way, he prophesied, he prophesied his recovery. He did not recover. He falsely prophesied. And then when he died, his wife, this was especially sad, waited by his corpse to raise again from the dead because the prosperity pimps and the false miracle workers promised her he wouldn't die. So she waited while his corpse rotted. We're, we try to tell you stuff in advance so you're not led astray by a false teacher. And there's no way to raise your hand in a, in a polite company, in a crowd, which is what the internet is. There's no way to rate. I don't know if it's a polite company, but it's a crowd. There's no way to raise your hand and go, um, this guy that everybody just seems to be in love with. I see a problem. It's a theological problem. Here's what it is. They're not what you think they are. And if they are a Christian, they have some things to clean up theologically there's no nice way to do that. And so the reason why, you know, contributors who thought I'm going to take my ball and go home and do it the nice way. And um, they were carried out on people's shoulders for like three months. They stuck it to pulpit and pen and, and Landon Chapman's. I still, to this day, I have people email me uh, or they'll post in the message in a comment. Uh, you know, here's, well, Sir, Servetus Diablos did that. Here's what Landon Chapman said about, he used to work for Pulp and Penny hates it. Um, that was over Karen Pryor. Who was right there? Remind me. Who was right there? And so then he's gone. Break then he's gone after Landon. a short while. Nobody, no, it, 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 you're always too late when you're trying to be nice. When nice is a priority, you're too late to be any darn good. You know what, what happened on that? If you remember, we, that was when we did the contributor hour and we filmed two of them. One got messed up and I, mean, I went to bed and there was a second one. And we were talking, remember Karen Swallow Pryor said that uh, multi-gender bathrooms were a common sense solution 
to the bathroom controversy. She said that in a book. And in that podcast, Landon just went up and down about, you know, how really bad that was and what was she thinking? Well, it turns out what she meant was to have three bathrooms, a ladies room, a men's room, and then like a family bathroom that anybody could go to. But with the way he, because he didn't do his research, the way he framed it was that she was advocating yeah. that anybody. My, could my go argument one at the time was creating a third bathroom to accommodate trannies is still not a common sense solution. Yeah, I don't know that's a common sense solution, but he Even, felt so bad over yeah, that. No, he didn't feel that bad about it. If you remember, it was his elders put put him in the vice grip. They they put him in a vice called him into a meeting and had a sit down talk where it's like, you have to quit pulpit and pen. You have to, it's a bad witness. And this Karen Swallow prior lady is great. So he did a swan song and apologized basically for his position on Karen Swallow prior. I would like, if I, I tell you what, and these days I talk to like, I, you know, I talked to David before he joined us and I'm like, you realize that you're signing your reputational death warrant. When you come work for pulpit and pen, you're going to, you're going to get that talk when you do that. I'd, I'd love to be locked in a room with Landon Chapman's elders. Five years. Has anybody later. else besides me ever had a Russell Moore talk, a Russell Moore talk with, uh, with the pastor, because here's a, here's a G three connection. Adam Blake Burl is the associate pastor of Praise Mill Baptist Church in Douglasville. That's Josh Bice's church. So he is Josh Bice's associate pastor. And now Josh Bice is on the anti-Russell Moore, anti-ERLC train. Well, before Adam worked for Praise Mill, he was the minister of families and students at Roland Springs Baptist Church. And I was on the phone with the pastor, Joe Ringwalt, one time, and Adam was in the room, in, in the room with Joe, and he's like, and the, Seth, all this stuff with Russell Moore and Beth Moore, and I'm like, Joe, Ru- Russell Moore is bad, and Adam, Adam Burrell, who, who works for Josh By, said this, this church will always support the RLC. Totally got his back. But now that someone different is signing his paycheck. I <laughs> bet you won't see Adam Burrell saying, "Oh yeah, you all see Russell Moore." So now, so now, Josh Bice's right hand guy is the guy who was going after you or us for criticizing the ERLC. That's yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'm never Ooh, gonna let, let down those words. Adam. Josh Bice is a discernment trailblazer. I tell you what. If you um, see and, a redheaded associate pastor at the next G three conference, that's Adam. I want you G3 listeners, because I know our listeners are their listeners. I want you to ask him about it. But people, hey, people did you have to answer. attack Pulpit and Pin for going after Russell Moore? And if so, uh, do you regret that now? And I bet you he'd say, well, at least I erred on the side of caution. When damage is done to the flock of God, it's never appropriate to err on the side of caution. If by caution, you mean you're cautious for the sake of the wolves. You should always be cautious for the sake of the sheep. That's what it means. I've noticed that people like to come around and write discernment articles and say, pull pit and pin does it wrong. They're too harsh. It, it ought to be done this way. And what I'm thinking is, why don't you just ignore the way that we're doing it that you don't oh, like? I got sidetracked. Write your so own article. When we went down this road, uh, I was trying to get somewhere. Uh, the point is, despite people who say, that's pull pit and pin, I'm not going to share it, or it's protestia, I'm not going to share it, or JD or whatever. That doesn't mean it's not being read. And guys, Dustin and Seth, how many times have you seen something at another website say, a, you know, um, more quote unquote respectable website and said to yourself, I said that. The, and have you ever, if, have you ever seen yourself clearly plagiarized or, or sourced, but not hat tipped? Happens to me all the time. Dustin, you've seen that, haven't you? I've seen a bit of it, yeah. I don't want to, maybe possibly the Christian Post on occasion, cough, cough. Oh, Leonardo Blair? Are you yeah. talking about Leonardo Blair? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I, didn't I get into it with him lately? Yeah, I think a couple weeks ago. You sent him a, an email that was harshly worded. What did he do? 
because <laughs> he, he he works for the Christian Post, and you're like, right. hey, Leo, y'all are, you constantly cite us, but you don't link us. Well, well, well he cast sh- he cast shade at at something somebody said, one of our contributors or something. Well, like what'll happen? Like you know, if I remember, you know, I'll say yes. You know, HT to Christian Post, we're all you know use them to create a post, but I'll write a post that only we have. Then I'll see it on their website like a week later, two weeks later, and all of a sudden, you know, no mention of us, even though I'm like, well, there's, that's ours. That's our piece. But that's our piece with uh, the paragraphs left roughly in the same order. I know it the sucks. content identical, just slightly reworded. And see, like we actually get mentioned in the, uh, the friendly atheist a lot. Yeah. So he quotes us all the time and he always gives us the very bottom, you know, hat tip to protest you. So even the friendly atheists. And we, we that. return the favor. We do. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. yeah. I call them memes all the time. Yeah. Well, I, th- I will say HT, those dirty, you know, rotten atheists. That, that, I call the, what is it? The star Wars, the, the hive of scum and villainy. I call them. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, I did try to comment on their blog one time. They blocked me immediately, but I like to think there's some kind of mutual respect um, just it, it simply on, the, the, um, you know, because of the HT, which means hat tip or, you know, yeah. thank you for these people bringing it to our attention. But I guess here was my point. I don't really care when they're sourcing us without, without telling you. I haven't cared until re- real recently when they want to s- spike the football over Russell Moore and that garbage crap that, that, uh, that, uh, O'Fallon said about, we've been in this from the beginning, AO men and G3. And I'm going, Oh my word, my head is going to explode. James White. That's who's on his cruise us. speaking, right? If you go to a sovereign nations or G3 cruise, James White does a cruise. Now he does one with Jeff Durbin and it's the same 15 Calvinists, if you will, are all the speakers on that cruise. They're, they're pumping one another, just like the typical Lifeway Southern Baptist pump one another. They're going to retreat Ronnie Floyd's book and he's going to retweet them. You know, Steve Games and Ronnie Troy, Ronnie Floyd retweeting each other. That's what I see when those guys yeah, just see, patting each other on the back. Let me go through these texts with Michael Fallon. This should be fun. Shouldn't it be fun? So um, let me see. I started this conversation last Wednesday um, and said, you told me that you would give credit to where it's due. It's past time. This and I sent him a screenshot of his comment where he says, uh, "Thank God for G." Th- oh, and then and then founders. Yeah, Tom Askell. What a he is the most delayed voice on social justice I can possibly imagine. Um, <clears throat> so I said, "Return the courtesy." Oh, I sent him a screenshot of what I said earlier that day, and I said. Thank you to Reformation Charlotte, Capstone Report, Rod Martin and Company, Sovereign Nations, the Social Justice Contra, Contras, the Evangelical Dark Web, Janet Medford. I said, return the courtesy. I mean, this whole time, uh, you know, I feel like this guy's mistress. He's been trying to, you know, he's been getting me to carry his water for years. And I said, um, Tom Buck and the Twitter Warriors did not do this. The bloggers and podcasters did this. You need to make this right before you guys open war on another front and you have to deal with bloggers and podcasters. I've had enough of this. And he says, good morning, JD. Yes, you are correct. And I plan on laying out the history of both the social justice movement and Christianity, uh, who was first, even Brandon Howes as well, and who came later only after significant pressure was applied, which would be him, to be fair. The only reason I was on, let me see, I don't want to necessarily read the whole thing. Um, (laughs) Anyways, after a long tweet, I said, say my name. And he says, if someone on your staff can send me the early articles on PNP, on Moeller, the Gospel Coalition, et cetera, I'll reference this material in my podcast. That's when I I mentioned this last week. I, I sent this to the guys. I said, send them something. It's, I, you know, I got mad myself because. I'm saying, you know, my articles, Michael, you plagiarize them all the time. You know, my articles, what are we talking about? You reached out to me. I didn't reach out to you. He reached out to me because he read our work at pulpit and pen. Why am I sending you articles you've already seen? 
And that's when Seth was like, yeah, he'll quote James Lindsay. And then I get back to him after I talked to us. I said, second thought, just leave my name out of it. And I'm like, don't contact me again. I'm done. And I said, or then he responded and said, brother, I'm going to keep that promise. I hope to earn your trust and you've been honorable with me through this process. I want to do what's right. I want to create a strong track record of what's happened and give credit where it's due. Um, and then complains about being thrown under the bus himself by various people. As I explained in the last podcast, it's we don't do polemics so that we can stand back and go, our discernment is more accurate than charismatic prophecy. Although to be fair, our discernment is more accurate than charismatic prophecy, <laughs> like any day of the week. The reason why we would say, pay attention to the track record is we're trying to demonstrate for you who you should be listening to in the future. So somebody who's sharing a lot of Gabriel Hughes's stuff, that's great. Just know that by the time he gets around to pointing out a problem, it already ate your lunch. And you can listen to Tom Askell. He's really great. Who will come in and chest thump himself to show that he's a lion tamer or something, but um, it's going to be way too late to do any good. The sermon is only beneficial to the church. If you're warning about the wolf before it eats the sheep. Um, I, you know, Dustin, um, if you're still, or yeah, you're still here, right? What would be uh, one of the, uh, the crowning, I don't know, not crowning moment would be the wrong word. What would be one of the highlights, the, the editorial or, or um, blog highlights that we, we have at Pulp and Pen, kind of a moment where you, besides MLK, where you were able to get a clear glance of Russell Moore and go, this guy's a danger. I think, oh, there he is. And he, you put me on the spot. Seth, I could, I could ask Seth too. Ask, ask when Seth was the moment where you're like, this is over the top? I'll give Dustin some time to think because I've got yeah. an easy one. It was the first Russell Moore article I've ever written. One of the, it was, would Russell Moore send you to a divorce party? And I pointed oh, out that it was getting popular in culture yeah. to have divorce parties. And this is completely unbiblical because – uh, divorce is the death of the marriage. It's the breaking of a covenant. God hates divorce. And this is God hates it, and is and it's the same way He feels about homosexual activity. And that's when Russell Moore said, when somebody asked him, and remember, this is the chief ethicist of the Southern Baptist Convention, and I'm just uh, a run of the mill seminary student at the time. And Russell Moore said, I would not go to the wedding, but I would go to the reception. Of and the that gay, had to be the, the gay wedding. Why would you go? Yeah. That's the party afterward to celebrate the union. And I'll give you an example. I had someone close to me recently invite me to a Roman Catholic wedding, and I didn't go because I'm not going to go to a mass. I did go to his reception because there's nothing wrong sure. with him marrying his wife, and I was happy for them, and I was glad to bring them a gift, and sure. I was glad to be invited and go share that day. No animosity or anything, but there was no way – if I had a homosexual friend invite me to his wedding reception, that I would go celebrate that. I was and taught I, that it was rude. It's rude to go to a reception without a gift. My question is, what brand of Egyptian cotton is Russell Moore buying for those homosexuals to put on their bed? And, and would that, he go without a gift? Ethicist. And if yeah, so, is he exactly. providing a toaster for their sodomy household? My that was to Target. Seth, I forgot about that until I started counting those articles. And then when I saw that, I'm like, I forgot all about this. That dude said he'd go to a gay wedding celebration. And I remember phrasing it that way at the time. And people were like, you're a liar. He didn't say he'd go to a gay wedding celebration. He said he'd go to a gay wedding reception. I'm like, okay. All right. What's the well, difference? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Six in one hand, half a dozen in, in, in the other. David, what about and, you? When was the moment you're like, this guy is beyond the pale bad? No, it's just, I mean, and take this from an angle of somebody who's just, I mean, everybody knows I've kind of re joined recently, but there's kind of a, and I'm going to chase a rabbit here for just a second. There's kind of a, there's an army of, of especially men out there, reformed leaning Christian men out there that do not like how feminized the church has become. 
They don't like that the men who run the church to a large degree go around in circles trying to explain everything to the point where there's no meaning to it anymore because they're trying to please everybody. Those are the guys who are reading Protestia. Those are the guys who are reading Pulpit and Pen. Those are the guys yeah. who are watching Rose Bros videos and they're watching, they're listening to Christian Commute. Yeah, probably not as much as me, but they're listening to Christian Commute. <laughs> and and I was the flavor all they of want, the want all they yeah. want is someone to tell them the plain truth. I was the flavor of the month for a while, like yeah. for a brief moment when it was cool to quote JD Hall. Just for a brief moment. Um, and then I kept talking. <laughs> would you have said that that was, uh, would you have said that was about the time that, uh, that Ken uh, Silva had passed? Yeah, slightly just right after that. I'd say 2013, 2014. Yeah, it was kind you of. You peaked right when Arrogant Canner, like the day he left, uh, he had to resign and the whole CB Scott story came out. Like all the criticism is validated of Louisiana College and Bruton Parker. Like that, that was the peak. Uh, yeah. And then the, we had a valley from there. In the 15, in Weren't the you 15, half million dollar man at that point. I'll Nobody remember the fifth. Yeah. I'll remember the 15 as long as I live. That was like a legitimate grassroots movement that included yeah, in that the end, Arminians, Calvinists, everybody. I mean, it was just, it was the wrath of God against Ed Stetzer and Lifeway. I wish I would have aimed more of that towards Tom Rainer. Well, we did. Alex Malarkey, all that. And I remember I gave, him a, I gave him an award. He won the inaugural worst Christian of the year award, Tom Rainer. I was, I was running the, uh, or actually not running. I was in the running store, which is like a, an agricultural store in Glendive, Montana. When I saw, uh, Ed Stetzer's tweet to me about 15 angry or about me, 15 angry men. And I went after Stetzer and then Stetzer responded about Braxton Canner. And I was in the runnings and I'm like, I'm going to get this guy. <laughs> I'm going to get him. And then it was, I think, wasn't it Tom Buck who suggested that we hashtag things to the 15? I think it was Tom Buck. One of, one I, of the contributors I, did. And then I gave idea the, was the road signs. It. We had the road signs. That was state. me. I did the road. I, I thought up the road you? sign. Yeah, I thought up the road sign avatar thing. I believe. I believe I did. Um, and within 24 hours, I get this call from Phil Johnson, who's like, "Why is Ed Stetzer calling me and asking me to get you to back off?" And so he was called. First, he called Frank Turk. I think. Yeah, it was Frank Turk. He's like, "You're friends with JD," and he's like, "Not exactly." And he called my brother. Ed Stetzer talked to my brother. It was like, get him by. Cause it was just an avalanche. It was just one of those perfect things that just sparked. But here's my point though. It's not any longer popular to quote protestian pulpit and pen. Okay. But our listeners, there's more of them than there's ever been. Big tech has taken a giant bite out of us in terms of traffic, but we have really hardcore committed followers and listeners and supporters who stick with us no matter what. And here's why it's because they, most of them themselves doubted, but then over time, and it takes about two or three years, I call it a polemic cycle about two or three years goes by and they, they found out we were right. I get an email every day, an email or a message on Facebook every single day from, for, from someone apologizing. And it's usually always the same. Hey, brother, you know, I know we had our differences and we got into that fight and, and uh, I'm sure you remember it. And I, you know, I, you were right. I apologize. And almost without exception, I have no memory of it and I have no idea who they are. And so I always respond by saying just like, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And I appreciate him doing that. So those are actually your most list, your most faithful readers are the ones who at one time thought you were wrong and had to be proven over time to be found right. And time after time, when we were proven correct about something, people say the same things, you know, the old cliches like, you know, a blind squirrel finds a nut or a clock is right. Broken clock is right twice a day. But over time they found out that broken clock is right a lot. It's right a lot. And here's the crazy thing. I think that over the course of the, the many years at pulpit and pen, 
I don't think that most of the time we were saying things that other people weren't thinking. Whether it's Russell Moore or Karen Pryor. I, mean, I think, well, with Karen Pryor, I don't think most people knew who she was before we, before we exposed her, which ultimately made her famous and got her, uh, you know, a sweet gig at Southeastern. But um, for the most part, we just did one thing other people didn't do. We said what we were thinking. You know, my mom's a fairly typical Southern Baptist woman, I think. You know, she's 72, grew up in church her whole life. Like, when I first shared Beth Moore stuff with her and she read it, she's like, oh, well, you're right about that. Nobody should listen to her. And she'd post, she'd post it on Facebook, and her Sunday school friends are like, Pat, what are you saying? And then I told her who Karen Swallow Pryor was. I just remember the look on her face, like, oh, that woman. Like, I know that my mom typifies all these all these people yeah. who were saying what they're thinking, but a lot of times they're not thinking it because they just don't know because their pastor doesn't tell them or their finance committee doesn't tell them. Well, but, and, and that's a, that's another component to this as well is there's a whole group of people in their churches who have seen this stuff or read, you know, some blog post by Russell Moore, or whoever and brought it to their pastor and said, Hey, this is dangerous. Look at this. And they've been attacked by their own church, right? They've been they've been cast as a black sheep and a divisive person and this and that and whatever. So they they have a lot of sympathy for what yeah. Protestia I, and and faithful discernment bloggers are doing. They're like, I've seen I this would, in my own life. This is happening. I would to me. say, you know, one of one of the ways that um, the Lord has been glorified by uh, Protestia is it gives people space, a space where they are not considered crazy or an outcast because discernment is a gift of the spirit that people shun. They'll embrace some nonsense, non-gift, like speaking gibberish, gobbledygook, gook. Like you could walk into a Southern Baptist church and say, hey, everybody, I believe in speaking in ecstatic utterances that are non-words, unintelligible speech and no known language. Uh, words that are beamed into my head, direct divine revelation from God. And you're going to have the typical Southern Baptist pastor go, well, we can make space for that. We can make space for that. But if you walk into the church and you say, I believe in the gift of discernment. And I, I don't think that the direction that the Southern Baptist convention is heading in is biblical or glorifying to God. I don't think it's conservative. And I do think there's lots of liberal drift, but the point is I'm, I'm, I'm for discernment. I think the typical Southern Baptist pastor would go, Oh, get out of here. Get out of here with that. that you're being divisive. I, you're being you're sowing yeah. division. You're sowing division among the brethren. You're dividing the body of Christ. Like, yeah, I'm just good, defining the body. A good of friend of mine told me, it. a good friend of mine told me, he's a pastor. He told me, like every pastor he knows bags on, on protesting on pulpit and they all think it's bad. You know? And yet the people in the pews like it, which, which is what probably scares them the most when you, when, it when doesn't. You yeah. It, the, what's happening there just so you know, is people reading protester, listening to polemics report, look at something like the Southern Baptist convention and they go, how can you be involved in this? You quote Spurgeon, but you're not going to take Spurgeon's advice on the downgrade. You're not going to you're not going to depart at once from the Baptist Union. You're going to you're you're going to give money to this? Or why are you closing down for the chest cold? You dang coward. Were you cold? You closed for a cold? Really? So the government is the head of the church now. And their their pastor just wants to live this life where the pastor can say um it's really hard to lead right now. And I've never done this before. And, you know, we're all navigating these troubled waters together. We're going to figure this out, but, you know, and they take this approach. It's like, so we're going to be closed for a while. And they're, when the fact, they just need to get some testosterone and go, no, forget this. I think every pastor ought to go through his pastorate, putting himself in the state of mind that he's 80 years old and has no one to impress. Like the pastor should just man up. So when the church then goes, it was a sin for you to close down. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't even take communion until well, none of us should take communion until we repent for ever having closed down. That was a sin for us. That ticks them off. They go, what, what have you been reading? What have you been reading? And that ticks them off. And what they don't know, what they don't know, and maybe, Maybe they do, 
but I figure what they don't know is in every episode, we tell people you need to be an active, giving, participatory, loving member of your biblical New Testament church. We try to embrace people to know if you've been given the spiritual gift of discernment, that's not for you. That's for the edification of the local church. So you have to share that. You don't have a choice. It's not, it's not your gift or rather it's not a gift for you. It's a gift God has given to you for others. So you have to share your discernment thoughts. You don't have a choice and you're going to be an outcast. You're going to be a pariah. You're going to be hated. People are going to think that you're doing it just to be cruel. And so when people then find out that there's a safe space for discernment, it makes them, I mean, sometimes, you know, people get pretty emotional in regard to what a polemics ministry means to them because it's a safe place for them to use the gift that God has given them. You know, just like I've had people walk into my church. They don't know who I am. They don't know who our church is. You know, they're not an internet type person and they walk in, they see the Spurgeon manuscript on the wall and they, sit through our worship service and, you know, my sermon's not about Calvinism or anything, but they walk up to me and go, Hey, are you a, you know, are you like, I'm like Calvinist. Yeah. And they don't even want to say it loud. They want to whisper it because they came from a church where it was kind of Calvinist or the church was Calvinist, but they never said the C word. They got to keep that on the DL. Well, you know, we kind of lean towards more towards God's sovereignty than free will. You know, we got to, you got to keep, keep that tone down. I'm like, it, and I, I, I've, I've been, I've been super blessed to be able to look people in the eye and go, this is safe. This is a safe place. Yes. We're Calvinists. I'll use the word from a pulpit. We'll say it out loud. This is safe. You don't have to worry about being attacked in the house of God for believing what the Bible teaches. We'll not only believe it, we'll, we'll celebrate the fact that we believe it and praise God for giving us an understanding of it. We, we can say Calvinism out loud in a, like not scream it, but in a normal tone of voice, you don't have to whisper it here. It's, it's okay. And people who are sick and tired of sitting through Beth Moore simulcasts just want to know that somewhere it's okay to go. Somebody shut up the aerobic stru- in structure and tell her to sit down. And that just makes people go, praise God. I'm not the only one that sees this. And, and that brings encouragement into people's lives. I don't know, I'm doing a lot of talking and you guys are here. We got about eight minutes left, but what do you think? I want to say, like, try and draw this back to Russell Moore. He is you know, one of the people we've criticized the longest. And it's been, I mean, encouraging in a way. I mean, you don't want Russell Moore to exist, but it's encouraging in a way to see other people come along and, and start seeing it and, and getting it. Like I remember Rick Patrick had one of the best Russell Moore articles ever. It was called Russell Moore, a Compendium of Concern. And it was at SBC Today. And it just linked all the different articles about Russell Moore, even some of ours. And I just want to say to the people who see on the other side that we were right about Russell Moore. Guys, we're right about Ronnie Floyd. We're right about Danny Aiken. We're right about Johnny Hunt. You name whoever you're Beth Moore, you name whoever your little hero is, who you think is the untouchable Southern Baptist uh, demigod of conservatism. And we're right about them. Tony Evans, like guys, we've done our research we looked into these people. We don't want people to be heretics. We want people to be orthodox. Yeah. We're orthodox. We're doing this to help people. Like I don't really see money out of this. The reason like, we I, have the reason we this have to gravitas help. is because we have a track record. We have no incentive to be proven wrong on something. We only have an incentive to give good advice and good insight and good discernment. Because when we are wrong, which has happened on a few occasion, uh, few occasions, we're beat with that forever. Um, you know, the examples that would come to mind would be AHA. I had to, you know, go. Hey, I'm sorry I ever endorsed this. This, is, you know, that would, I. By the way, I can say Frank Turk was right about that. <laughs> That's why Turk was mad at me even before the Russell Moore thing is because. He was like, AHA is bad news. He had had some personal interactions with it that I had not had, you know, like church repent project stuff. Um, and, uh, and, or with Josh Duggar, who I defended with Janet Medford. 
But Seth, you've been around long enough to see some of our relationships be healed with some of the people that we've tangled with in the past, particularly the Calvinist Arminian divide or me and Janet, you know, Medford, she really really Medford. There's no D it's Medford. <laughs> You're killing me. This whole podcast. It's Medford. 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 All right. Like, uh, my phone is Janet, but you know, Janet did a blog post that really ripped my head off one time. And uh, I don't think it's up anymore, but um, like Tim Rogers with a D with a D. <laughs> It also has a D. <laughs> I would say Tim Rogers with a D because uh, somebody, one of our contributors, uh, uh, spelled his name Rogers with a D, and he flipped <laughs> out. So then, for the last ten years, I, every time I say his name, I'm like with a D, <laughs> and then people chime in. They're like, "There's not a D." I'm like, "Yes, there is." It's a silent. It's a silent D. But I've seen Rick Patrick. Uh, say some favorable stuff about us and we've said some favorable stuff about um, Rick Patrick. I don't think I'll ever get there with Leighton flowers, but um, Leighton flowers is unregenerate. Rick Patrick's probably saved. I think that's the difference. Well, I don't include. Yeah. You, uh, Rick Patrick is pretty much an open theist, not Rick Patrick, but uh, Leighton flowers, Leighton flowers. Yeah. But we have been able to, to heal some of those, some of those wounds. Even I thought Dustin was a wayward child there for a while. He seems to be okay. I came back to the fold. Yeah, he came back. That's why, listen, that's that we talk yeah. about Dustin the fatted never, calf. I never had to pull the knife out of my back from, from Dustin. To that's his why you really slaughter the fatted calf, not because a heretic leaves, but because the sun returns. Well, right. I, I would celebrate nothing more than Russell Moore coming out and say, you know what, guys, for the past few years, I was trying to be too hip and too progressive and too winsome. And I got away from the gospel and I got away from what was biblical. And please, guys, well, forgive me. I, I would, then nothing I would, would not me rejoice happy. if he said that, but only because it would, it would be a lie. He would have to back up and say, this is who I've always been because we've been able to demonstrate. Back when he was a Democrat staffer, he's always been this way but if he were to if he were to repent that'd be but that i mean that would be great dustin what were you trying to say there i was gonna say that you know i came back to you guys like a like a chick that gathers underneath the the wings of the hen pretty much but like keep in mind like we've been bashing we're well, not bashing we've been talking about uh, uh uh more since like 2013 right like you know back more in, 2010 yeah, more yeah like back then, you were that uh, uh, Jesus was an illegal uh, alien. Like it's oh, been, it's been, oh, it's that been far, right? It's been almost almost ten. Jesus years. was a yeah, refugee. Yeah. Two thousand, I think, yeah. with Russ Moore is about is it's a, it was about two thousand and eleven or two thousand and twelve. Yeah. I thought you meant Beth Moore, but yeah, like, Jesus I, I was an, like, think an, is like, an illegal alien. Yeah, like when I reflect on Moore, like what has the ERLC ever done? Really, like what is one piece of legislation that they passed like what what do they do they do nothing right they do nothing they get four million dollars a year they spend you know 70 percent of that on travel expenses and well they told us to close down uh during covid they repeatedly preached to us that it was our biblical responsibility to submit the church to the rule of caesar instead of jesus and they haven't lifted a dang stinking finger to help the brothers up in Canada who are being persecuted by their government, despite the fact that there are 10,000 Southern Baptists in Canada. Uh, what they, they have done the after the fact and each time is the to Supreme put, Court that the Southern Baptist Convention churches and entities were not autonomous. Remember that? Yeah. They put us in legal jeopardy. Every Baptist that church stabbed every in local the church country. in the back. Yeah. To they defend. Did that. To like defend. That's one job. You got one yeah, job. In, in a lawsuit that was in a lawsuit that has exposed NAMS corruption in order to defend the North American Mission Board. And by the way, the entire polemics ministry of Protestia, uh, Pulpit and Pen, et cetera, started. I was the biggest fan of the Southern Baptist Convention. And it started because the North American Mission Board ran roughshod over local church autonomy. And I had to get a personal firsthand look at how the North American board, uh, North American mission board operates before I, I said, I think they're so corrupt. They should be broken up by the RICO statute. And the NAM has traditionally always been the most like financially corrupt, um, entity in the Southern Baptist convention. Um, but 
after all of this time, we've seen great strides that the Lord has made um, to call people out of that wicked denomination. And I'll repeatedly say, if you're in the SBC and you think you're going to save the denomination, I would just look at the last 30 years of denominational history and consider that the fundamentalists were right. You, you don't reform something that Jesus has not saved. And Jesus didn't come to save a denomination. Uh, Jesus came to save people. And he came to work through the local bodies known as churches or local churches, local congregations. You have no need to fight for the SBC. Give that fight up. So um, I'm going to ask the guys real quick for their biggest regret when it comes to polemics. I'm going to go first. I'm going to say, I regret ever from the beginning thinking that the Southern Babs Convention could be saved because I've spent a significant portion of my life on a lost cause. And so I wish I would have focused maybe differently some of our energy and efforts. It wasn't until about 2017 or 16 that I knew for sure it was only a matter of time before we left the convention. I wish I would have come to that conclusion a long time ago. So oddly enough, my regret isn't that we were too quick to come to conclusions. It's that we were too slow to come to the conclusion that the Southern Baptist Convention can't be saved. Seth, what about you? We haven't done everything right. Perfect. No, but you know what? I'll tell you what. I wish that I'd you know, maybe take 25 or 50% of the time I spent writing an article about Perry Noble or some dope who was going to run himself into the ground, no matter what I said, uh-huh. uh, and watched a ball game with my kids or something, or spent more time with my wife. When you look up this stuff on the internet, it gets to be all you talk about, especially when you're somebody like me, who's autistic and, and hones in on things. I wish I would have been more balanced in how much time I spent on polemics and how much time I spent at home or, trying to minister to the local church rather than writing a bunch of articles with the hope, like you said, that it was going to reform something and it was going to do something. Yeah. I think in terms of, in terms of prior prioritization editorially, um, we should, and just as a general rule moving forward, we should never spend an inordinate amount of time covering those that we know are going to go down uh, in just a matter of time. Perry Noble was a clear example of that. Like, I think at the when he started to spiral, we knew that his tweet, he was drunk in his tweets. Like we had had that, we had had that discussion. This guy's lit. He's on drugs or something. But you look at somebody like, um, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of examples. Uh, Tulian Tavijan was one. I would rather have, I mean, I'm all for more time with your kids, but also, we could have and we should strive in the future to prioritize those, not the low-hanging fruit. Roseboro does a lot of that, and I love Roseboro, and he's been a powerful influence in my life. But Roseboro picks on a lot of the William Tapley, you know, Cat Kerr, crazy um, folks. We know, how, we know how Todd Bentley is going to end up, right? There's no question. Let's focus more on the Russell Moores. Let's focus on those that nobody else is calling out, not the one who everybody's calling out, um, which maybe that means fewer Kyle J. Howard spoof videos in the future, but that's pretty epic. Yeah, I'm new. Justin, what about you? What's the regret? <laughs> Honestly, I mean, going back to stuff before, like I kind of miss where I regret kind of leaving for a bit. Like, I think I have like, I have the, the, the heart and the temperament for the ministry. I think I, you know, I think I can handle this stuff pretty well. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't, I don't grow weary of it. And so I kind of wish that, you know, there's four or five years where I just, I was gone, right? And I wasn't um, using my gifts that way. And so, uh, just, I don't know, a lot of things happened. Um, and since Dustin has um, taken over as a managing editor, I've been able to focus my time and attention on other things. That's been a <laughs> Giant yeah. blessing. Dustin, I've never asked you this question before, but in your hiatus, uh, and you never I never did have to pull a knife out of my back you put there. Let me ask you, just to put you on the spot. Did you ever did you ever have people come to you and encourage you to uh, you know, 
put the knife there in, in, yeah, in yeah. the pulpit and pin. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got, I mean, I got people asking me to, you know, Hey, can I share the, you know, can you share the bunker or, or share, you know, share the contents of the bunker. Uh, people asking me, you know, what are the secrets? What happened? You know, what I really think. And I kind of just, for the most part, just, no, nope, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to kind of blow things up. Yeah. Betray that trust. Keep in mind too, as people are, uh, I've seen some of my Facebook friends share stuff from Seiko Woods. Remember what Kofi did? Seth had posted a photo of his child with a Confederate flag because Seth is a redneck from Georgia who doesn't have a Confederate flag in Georgia. And I had uh, made fun of Seiko's Ebonics by using the term bra, B-R-U-H. Um, which, by the way, I also make fun of Dog the Bounty Hunter's, um, uh, what's it called? What do you call it the Hawaiian language? Pig something? I forget. His, uh, his Hawaiian bra, you know, or bra, yeah, bra. So I, but screenshots of that were then taken and given to Seiko Woods, who then ran us into the ground as racist because I make fun of Ebonics and improper English and, uh, and as well as everything else under the sun, I'm an equal opportunity mocker and uh, accuse Seth of, of racism by what was really just an unfair gotcha photo grab. That was actually a picture. My wife posted that Clayton Jennings stalked my, her Facebook page to find and shared. Um, but it got from, it went from our private com box. Yeah. And I was like, look what Kofi this creep to Seiko. Clayton yeah. Johnson or Clayton Jennings posted like stalking my wife's Facebook page. And then like they gave that to right. say who had always been friendly with us. I never, I never understood that. Right. And then last up, I'd say my, my biggest regret is ever um, carrying anybody's water. I wish I never would have done that. I started with Albert Moeller who told me for a long time what to write. Um, I remember one time they found Irgan Canner's, um, a video, a, a video of him speaking at Southern Seminary, um, telling his lies about his life story, and Mueller sent that to me and asked me to cover it and promised that it wouldn't come down. Whether it's Michael O'Fallon or whoever, I wish we never would have done that. Remember this, gang, as uh, as you yourselves do discernment. If you're not man enough to say it yourself, don't expect somebody else to say it. Say it yourself. And if you aren't mature and man enough to say it yourself, just let it go unsaid. Or else what you're doing is you're just making the target of those that the enemy can attack that much smaller. And then all of the volleys and the fiery darts of the enemy just go on the few who are saying what everybody else is thinking. And then that makes it hard on those who are actually out in front. Thank you for listening to this weird uh, episode of Polemics Report. I don't think we've done anything like this in years. But thanks, guys, uh, for your service, for your work. Also, uh, all the, the helpers like uh, Jerry Brinkman there that helps with the insurgency. God bless you all. We'll talk to you later. Until next time, as always, Simper Reformata.